Welcome to Navigating the Virtual Road to Autonomous Driving, using simulations to test, train, and validate autonomous vehicles. Sponsored by the ABA Tort Trial and Insurance Practice Section, and section sponsors Thomson Reuters, MDD, and Atlas Legal Research. If you're seeking CLE credit, you must attend the entire program. Partial credit is not available. Please click on all participation verification alerts during the program to confirm your attendance. And immediately after the program ends, a link to complete the certification process will appear. Evaluation and the CLE affidavit, providing your bar information as requested. Once the completed form is submitted and your attendance verified, your certificates will be emailed to you. Moderating the program today is Gail Goderer. Gail, you may proceed with the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for joining us, and thank you to the ABA for hosting us. Uh, my name is Gail Goderer. I am an attorney based in Connecticut where my practice focuses on things like autonomous vehicles and other emerging technologies and the data that these technologies collect and the privacy, cybersecurity, and ethical issues associated with that. Uh, I am also the chair of the ABA TIPS Automobile Litigation Committee. If you're not a member, we encourage you to join us, please, and also to follow us on Twitter, and our Twitter handle will be at the end of the slides. And my co-chair on that committee, uh, actually the uh, incoming chair next year, is Ron Hedges. Ron, can you tell us a little bit about you, please? Sure, and good morning, Gail, and good morning to my fellow faculty and to everyone listening in. My name is Ron Hedges. I am a senior counsel with the Denton's firm in Midtown, New York. Among other things, I served 20 plus years as a United States magistrate judge sitting in Newark, New Jersey. My forte, if you will, has always been electronic information in both civil and criminal proceedings. I have written and contributed to some texts about those, and I'm looking forward to working with everyone today. So thank you, Gail. Great. Thanks, Ron. And Richard, can you tell us a little bit about you, please? Yeah, my name is Richard Kelly. I am the senior engineer at the Nevada Center for Applied Research at the University of Nevada. I live in Reno, and I'm a roboticist. Uh, and today, specifically, I'm going to be talking about the technical aspects of building autonomous vehicles uh, using my project to actually build such a vehicle uh, as a reference point. Terrific. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. And last but certainly not Thank least, you. Justin, can you tell us about you, please? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, Justin Daniels. So. I am an attorney at Baker Donaldson, but I've also become a real subject matter expert on cybersecurity and data protection. And today I will be talking about autonomous vehicles from the perspective of the Curiosity Lab, which is a smart city initiative down outside of Atlanta and Peachtree Corners and how we have built cybersecurity and privacy into that facility because one of our main focal points is smart transportation with autonomous vehicles. Great. Glad Thank you, here. Justin. Thank you. So uh, by way of disclaimer, the information in these slides and in this presentation is not legal advice. Please do not consider it to be legal advice. The presentation represents our personal views and is offered for informational and educational purposes only. So give you a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about and just very briefly what our autonomous vehicles are, just to give everyone a reference point if you don't really already have it. Then we're gonna talk about reasons for using simulations to test and train autonomous vehicles. Richard is gonna walk us through how simulations work, which is really fascinating. Then we're gonna talk about how the results of simulations may be used, and also ways that the data used and generated by simulations could be used as evidence in a wide range of proceedings that we'll talk about. And then finally, we're gonna talk about the nature of this data. Should it be shared, is it proprietary? What are the <coughs> ramifications of both of those options? And similarly, our objectives, we hope to provide you with an understanding of how simulations work 
help you learn about the data that they use and generate, consider, it, consider how they may be used, and for safety and legal proceedings. So to start, what are autonomous vehicles? So you can see on the slide, this is the latest graphic from SAE, which is pretty much, I think, the recognized levels. This is the recognized leveling of uh, autonomous vehicles, although there's lots of criticism about them. And this diagram has recently been revised to be what you see on the screen now. But again, just by way of a very high level overview, you can see that there are six levels of autonomous driving. The three on the left are not considered autonomous. That's considered low level. So level zero is the car that you probably, depending on if you're closer to our age, drove in and as a kid where you didn't even have power steering, you had to roll the windows down, that kind of a vehicle. Then as you move to the right, level one, is a little bit more than that, but the, the key point here is that the human is performing all the dynamic driving tasks. The car isn't doing any of that on its own. It's fully dependent on the person in the driver's seat. Then as we move to level two, again, you can see you have more and more features that the car is able to do. You have more sensors, and a lot of the cars on the road today would fall into level two. So if you have a car where your mirrors beep if somebody gets too close to you or you get too close to someone else, if you have something where you have the screen that helps you park and go in reverse, you can see that on the screen in front of you. Those would be level two examples. Level two gets controversial because Tesla describes itself as a level two, but features offers a feature that it calls autopilot there's a whole debate on whether that's an appropriate name that we will not get into today but tesla if you have one or have been in one tesla is arguably if it is a level two it's a level two plus plus so i would just put out there that level two a, a typical example is not a tesla that you can buy today and again, Richard, interrupt me if you disagree with any of this, and I'll turn to you as soon as I get through the levels. But right now, you can't buy any of the level threes and up that we're going to talk about. So level three and up in the green is where we start to get into what are considered highly, uh, highly automated vehicles or autonomous vehicles. Again, touching on the issue that term, the terminology is confusing as well but what's key here in three four and five is that the person isn't driving the car when these features are engaged so even if you happen to be sitting in the driver's seat the car is performing these dynamic driving tasks so the the features vary and that's the difference between three four and five three you may have heard about the handover which is very complicated from both a technology and a legal perspective, but essentially when the, the car can perform a lot of driving functions, but it can get to a point where it doesn't understand what is around it, either because of fog or a sensor malfunction, and it can tell you that you have to take over and start driving. So there's issues both technologically and legally about how much is a reasonable amount of time to give someone to respond after that kind of a warning goes on, many issues, and that's why some manufacturers are skipping level three. Going to level four, the, under four and five, the driving features, the technology will not require you to take over the driving. The distinction is in a level four, this will only work in certain geofenced areas, certain conditions. So outside of those conditions, the technology won't work. Level five is the perfect world that many of us look forward to, where the car can do everything and you as the person don't have to do anything. And the vehicle that you're in at that point may well not have a steering wheel or pedals. So, Richard, you want to jump in? What are your thoughts from a technology perspective on the levels? Um, is it clear enough? What should people take away from this just at a high level? Yeah, so, I think your your description of the levels is great. Uh, and I would say that 
Uh, today, most manufacturers, regardless of, of what, what they're marketing, are really targeting level four, uh, where the vehicle can drive itself if it doesn't know how to proceed, it knows how to pull over safely. Um, I think fewer and fewer people are saying that they're going to have a level five autonomous vehicle. Um, if, you, if you think about how hard it would be for a human to claim seriously that they can drive anywhere under any conditions, uh, whether that is, uh, you know, through the middle of Nevada, which is empty and pretty easy, or uh, in New York or downtown New Delhi, uh, that, that is a, a pretty, pretty difficult thing to do. Uh, and so fewer and fewer people are claiming that that's their goal. Um, it, is, it is nice to have that as an aspiration, though. But, but really, it's level four that we're probably going to see um, maybe in the next, you know, within 10 or 20 years. Right. And another reason being, you know, in theory, if everybody was driving a level five vehicle, it would be a lot easier because the vehicles could communicate. But the reality is that even if we had a level five within, let's say, the next decade that could be on the road and could be sold, you would still have a whole wide range of vehicles, many of which are older and have no connectivity. And so you wouldn't have a you know perfect world where one person breaks, every other car understands that and responds because you'll just have a whole wide range of vehicles out there. So that 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 again stands in the way of our perfect world. But yes, but that that at least is, yeah. is the overview of that. So all right, so that's a high level about the levels we're going to be talking about and this graph and you have the site to it. This is just to make the point that at this right now, there's no federal law on aut regulating autonomous vehicles at any level. There have been several attempts in Congress to uh, enact an autonomous vehicle law. It has not happened. And similar to privacy laws, a lot of people think we need to have a federal autonomous vehicle law because cars cross state lines. And right now, as you can see on this graph, you have a, a patchwork of a lot of state laws that vary significantly. So some have no laws governing autonomous vehicles, some have very detailed laws, and most of them differ from each other, which leads to a lot of confusion and complication if you're a manufacturer and you're trying to design a vehicle that will be compliant everywhere the car might go. So that's part of the challenge. So if you want more yeah, detail, you can go to this link. Go ahead, Richard. I, I would just add that as someone who is developing an autonomous vehicle system uh, and who lives uh, essentially on the border between Nevada and California, um, it, is, it is extremely, I would say in my case, prohibitively difficult to deal with this interstate issue because the laws that between these states vary so, so much. Um, you know, so, so for example, I can't even drive around Lake Tahoe with my car because I would have to cross the border from Nevada into California and back. Uh, and, and the regulatory challenges are, are extreme, uh, particularly in California. Right. And we, we saw that a couple of years. What, what, when, we saw that a couple of years ago when Google was trying to make a vehicle without a steering wheel and pedals that it thought would be approved in, in, um, in California and then turned out it wasn't. So that's a, a perfect example. Justin, yes, did, was that you? I just wanted to overlay one more thing for our listeners Please. as they think about this. So overlay what was just discussed about the laws for autonomous vehicles when you cross state lines. But in order to make autonomous vehicles work and have smart transportation, which they're a key component of, they all emit data. And we're going to talk about how we share data. So now overlay on that that we have no overarching privacy laws we alluded to. And now you begin to see the complexity on multiple levels because you have the vehicles themselves and making sure they're safe. And then you have the whole data uh, part of vehicles because they're a new form of technology. And so I want to really draw that out for our listeners today because most of the time, and I'll talk more about this later, uh, thinking through privacy and security on the front end, it's typically an afterthought with the response we have today, which is some really complicated regulations are lacking, and it makes it a much tougher environment to um, navigate. Exactly. Okay. So 
Next, we're going to talk about some of the reasons for using simulations to test and train autonomous vehicles. And before we jump into that, it's probably helpful also just to explain that the, the existing laws that we have now are part federal, part state, right? So right now, federal law governs when a vehicle is safe enough to be sold in this country. And then state laws govern things like speed limits on state roads, insurance regulations, what you have to do to get a driver's license, although it's another fascinating conversation about what kind of training and our licensing will have as we move towards higher levels of autonomy. But that's the, the bifurcation we have right now. And that may be helpful to folks as you think about the issues that Richard and Justin both highlighted. So Justin, tell us a little bit about the Curiosity Lab at Peachtree Corners. So the, the Curiosity Lab at Peachtree Corners is a really innovative smart city initiative, principally around smart transportation. And the city created this, and um, we'll go to the next slide and talk a little bit some, about some of the aspects of it. Um, there's a one and a half mile autonomous vehicle test and demonstration track, and there's technology infrastructure. But what makes it really uh, unique is as we speak today, they have a fully functional autonomous shuttle that goes around the track and can drop people off because the whole lab is within a 500 acre technology park. The other thing that makes it really interesting is the first deployment in the United States of uh, remotely piloted e-scooters is also in Peachtree Corners. You may have seen when you go to San Francisco or other cities where people are getting around on little scooters and they kind of leave them wherever they may end their ride and it's become kind of a public eyesore. Well, here you can use your iPad or your iPhone and call the scooter and it will drive to you. You get on the scooter, go where you need to go. And then when you're done, the scooter will drive away and go to a collection point so that it can be sanitized and then go back out on its next, uh, for its next rider. And so what's interesting about this project for, what we're talking about today is, as I said before, what have we built into the DNA of the facility specifically as it relates to autonomous vehicle testing to deal with the privacy and security of the data, the vehicles themselves, how they may communicate with others, how they may interact with the road. And if you take a look at the next slide, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about what we're talking about there. So on the next slide, so you can see the road there with the yellow lines, that's where cars go. Right next to it, the blue lines, that's where you can put some autonomous vehicles and we have intelligent street lights that have IoT devices. But think about one thing I've learned is, I didn't realize this, but GPS is pretty accurate to about seven to eight feet. Well, if you're in an autonomous vehicle and you might be next to bikers on the side of the road, five to seven feet isn't good enough. You need micro positioning so that you're really accurate to 10 or 12 meters because you could be next to a biker and we don't really want the car to swerve into the biker for obvious safety reasons. And so the question that I present to the audience is when we built the facility, we put cybersecurity and privacy into the DNA. We thought up front, what are some of the data that'll be created by autonomous vehicles? We're using drones. And so one of the big takeaways that I want you to think about from this webinar today is when we're testing and we're building and simulating autonomous vehicles, how are we thinking about the data that's been created? How are we going to use that data? How do we share that data? How might that data and the security around it highlight vulnerabilities so that when this is all deployed, um, we could have challenges, and that's the whole point of this lab, is think of an environment where you can go and test all of this technology where it's not the real world, but it's really not far from it. And the thing that makes this so amazing is it costs nothing to do this, and you get to keep the intellectual property as long as you comply with the requirements of testing. So let me say that again. It is free to test and you actually get to keep the intellectual property. So it's like a no-brainer to want to do this, and it was created for this purpose in mind, and that's part of um, what we're going to talk more about today, but that's what we can highlight at the uh, lab. So last slide, please.
And so you can see how you have vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to device, vehicle to home, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to grid, and vehicle to pedestrian. And the whole point of all this is think about how all of the different data is being created by the autonomous vehicle and how it's connecting to all these different uh, types of devices. And as we'll talk, touch a little bit on, when we talk about IoT devices, they are notorious for how they lack in security. And now we're going to start to create smart infrastructure and smart cities where autonomous vehicles are a linchpin of this. And so again, I'm putting the question out there today is how do we start to think about the data that gets created and making sure that it's secure and it's being used for appropriate purposes because we've seen in other instances, the city of San Diego is an interesting one with smart technology where you've gone down the route of into a surveillance type of mindset. And so that's really what we need to be thinking about when we're talking about um, autonomous vehicles and all the data that's getting created and the security and privacy aspects that we need to consider on the front end. Um, Absolutely. I think that's my last slide. Yep. Excellent. So, Richard, can you tell us a little bit about what you have going on at the Intelligent Mobility at the in going on in Nevada? And I have to say, by way of full disclosure, your colleague Professor Carlos Cardillo, who is amazing, gave me a tour of all this, and uh, I recommend it to people to take a look at your website and learn more about it. But can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing there in Nevada? Yeah, happily. So uh, the, the research that we're conducting in Reno, mostly in Reno, Nevada, but also a little bit in Las Vegas, uh, is really aiming at a lot of the similar sorts of, of goals that uh, Justin just talked about in uh, Georgia. Um, so if, uh, Gail, you could go to the next slide. Um, we really have two components to what we're doing. Uh, we are actually building an autonomous vehicle. So uh, the slide here shows an image of that. It's a 2017 Lincoln MKZ. Uh, and so we start with an entirely ordinary vehicle uh, and then we add uh, technology to it to give it the ability to drive itself. Um, kind of going back to something that, that Gail mentioned earlier talking about the SAE levels, uh, there's an interesting question of, of which vehicles can be made autonomous. Um, and the reality is actually that very few have the necessary electronics to even be retrofitted with autonomous driving capability. Uh, and so that's probably going to change over the next couple of years. But I, I would expect that for at least another decade, uh, if not two, um, there are going to be a lot of cars on the road that just cannot even be made autonomous if you wanted to hack that together yourself. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Gail. I've asked you one question in about addition, that before we go on, Richard. Richard, can yeah, I ask yeah, you one yeah. question? Yeah. There, there's a lot of talk sure. about aftermarket, just going to what you just said. There's a lot of talk about aftermarket parts and that how maybe even though a lot of companies are not, there's, a, there's kind of a divergence. Do you build your own autonomous vehicle from the bottom up? Do you take one and build on to it like you have? And then there's talk about an aftermarket market where people are going to be mm -hmm. able to add on. And what do you think about that? Is that overly, it, it seems like that's overly optimistic or potentially dangerous based on what you said in your knowledge having built these compared to some of the things you read online about how people are saying those things could be ready for sale very quickly. Yeah, so I think actually in some cases that's true. So uh, the real limiting factor we found when we were trying to decide um, how we would build our vehicle was um, actually operating the steering wheel and the pedals. So the, the reason that we went with a Lincoln MKZ is that the power steering system actually allows uh, a computer to control the movement of the steering wheel. Uh, most cars, even even cars that are 10 years old, don't have that capability. So you would have to actually uh, open up the steering column and install motors, and you'd have to install uh, some kind of actuator that, that is literally capable of pressing the accelerator and the brakes. Uh, so it is possible. Uh, you know, researchers all over the world have done that. Um, it becomes extremely inconvenient, and I mean, obviously you avoid the warranty on your car. Uh, so. <laughs> I would not expect a lot of that, um, at least for a while, um, as more and more cars on the road are entirely computer controlled. 
uh, that's going to get easier and easier. But but like I said, I, I would expect that for at least 15 years, you're going to see a lot of cars on the road that are not capable of being retrofitted uh, with an aftermarket kit. Um, you know, short of, of complete, almost completely re-engineering the controls on the car. Uh, so uh, I think it is optimistic to say that aftermarket kits are going to be everywhere soon. Okay, great. So moving on to your next slide, go right ahead. Yeah, so in addition to that vehicle, we also have been instrumenting uh, the infrastructure of the city of Reno with computers and sensors to enable better testing of autonomous vehicles in real world conditions. Uh, so this is something that we've been doing in conjunction with the city of Reno and our regional transportation commission, which operates buses. We've been installing LIDAR sensors, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, all throughout the town, uh, starting with the, the corridor you see pictured uh, there. Um, and we're using that corridor to test the capabilities of not just the autonomous vehicle system that I'm developing, but also third party groups can come in, uh, similar to what Justin described in Atlanta, and test their hardware and software. Uh, and we work with them to make sure that the, the data that they're able to gather there is useful for their business purposes, uh, but also safe, uh, because we are testing in a live environment. Uh, and what we found is that track testing is absolutely essential. Uh, simulation testing is, again, absolutely essential, uh, but that there are certain problems that you really can't solve uh, without data collected from very realistic real world conditions. Yeah, and that's critical. That was something we're going to talk about more too, this balance. You know, is it does it need to be on road testing? Does it need to be simulation or is it somewhere in the middle? And just to tell people just to flesh out a little more why we're covering this topic and why we think simulations are so important is there's been a, a report from the RAND company, RAND Corporation, that estimates that people would need to drive 11 billion miles, or these vehicles at least, maybe not people, but would need to drive 11 billion miles to match the human error rate. So the argument is that in order to get federal approval, these vehicles will have to be as safe as a human driver right now to meet the standard of a presumably alert, sober human driver. And so the the estimates are about that you'd need 11 billion miles of driving to reach that level. And obviously, if that's what we have to do on the road, we're not getting there anytime soon. There are also questions about are people driving the same miles, right? If everybody's driving around Northern California, are we really mapping everything we need to map? Does that count towards the 11 billion miles? So simulation becomes a really clear way to cut through that and get use that data efficiently. Then there's also an argument, we've seen some accidents, which we're not gonna to discuss today, but some accidents due to that have happened during on-road testing of autonomous vehicles or things that are purported to be autonomous vehicles. So simulation, obviously, you can do in a lab. It's a computer. You don't have to worry about anybody being injured. So that's another argument in favor of simulations and also that you can create so-called edge cases, things that may not happen in reality or may happen so rarely that your car on the road may not encounter that, but you can make that happen and train the computer on it and then train the car on it through the simulation. So moving on, let's talk now. Richard, I'm going to talk, turn it over to you if you want to give you the last word on what I just talked about in terms of that balancing and then tell us how simulations work. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would just agree with everything you just said about the, that question of, of balance and the need to find a good balance uh, between on-track testing, where you have complete control of all conditions, uh, simulation testing, uh, which, as we'll talk about in just a minute, actually builds on uh, real-world data collection efforts, and then actually driving your car in the world. Uh, it is... Uh, Maybe unfortunate, maybe not unfortunate, but but we I think the reality is that we do need to test our vehicles on roads to be sure that they work. 
uh, the, the thing that makes that tricky is that, of course, testing in the real world introduces risks uh, that you don't have in simulation or on a closed track. And so doing that safely is actually something that uh, occupies a lot of time of everyone who is working on autonomous vehicles, uh, at least that I've talked to. So um, let's talk a little bit more about how these systems work to understand uh, how simulation can play into building that kind of system and, and can really make more sense of that balance. Uh, so the slide that you see here is actually the trunk of our autonomous vehicle. Um, and uh, what you can see is, is that there's, there's really no room for luggage uh, in, in current autonomous vehicles. This is uh, a little messier than maybe the, some of the manufacturers, though not all of them. Um, and what you see is actually a, a, a whole computer setup. So we have uh, a power distribution system. We have uh, a computer, uh, which uh, is pretty fancy, but not too far removed from uh, a desktop computer, a high-end desktop machine. Uh, and then we have a lot of cables that connect the sensors on the top of the vehicle uh, to that computer system. Uh, this whole thing runs off of a battery, but as you might guess by just looking at this, it is a, a somewhat complicated system uh, in terms of hardware. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see that uh, when you look at the software architecture of a system, uh, the complexity just grows. Uh, so this diagram that you see uh, is uh, actually the, the first draft or the, the draft of the previous system that we were running on the car. Uh, the current system we have uh, is actually a little more complicated than this, but this captures the essential elements of an, uh, a software system for a car. Uh, so each of these boxes is not just one computer program, but typically several computer programs that are all running simultaneously uh, that are updating uh, tens to hundreds of times per second uh, as a car is driving itself down the road. Uh, and so uh, each of these boxes that you can see is something that uh, is probably going to be simulated uh, by a manufacturer. Uh, and it's something that you have to know works. Um, so for example, there's a box labeled perception uh, that includes everything that the vehicle is going to need to do to understand the world around it. Uh, so that includes uh, processing camera data, uh, breaking an image or a sequence of images or video into uh, its constituent parts to see that there is a road, to see that there are cars in front of the vehicle, behind the vehicle, to see the pedestrian who's about to jaywalk. Um, all of those things are handled by that perception system. Uh, a really interesting one is that blue box next to it that I've labeled prediction. Uh, so cars uh, have to be able to predict the actions of people and animals and inanimate objects around them. Um, so you probably don't think about this too much when you drive, but the reality is that you're making predictions about what other people are going to do uh, almost constantly. Uh, you don't really become aware of that until someone starts to do something very strange and your predictions go wrong and you have to really think about what others are doing. Uh, but that task that you solve almost effortlessly on a constant basis uh, is something that cars have to do uh, and they have to do about as well as a person as Gail was indicating. Uh, and so, uh, you know, these, these tasks are, um, you know, things that a car has to do very, very well um, and for some of these, the cost of failing is, is extremely high. Uh, so if you're predicting that someone is not going to cross the street uh, and you're wrong uh, and you, you hit them, that, that is a catastrophic problem. Um, if, you, if you misidentify a stop sign at the speed limit, that is, again, a catastrophic problem. Um, and, and so all of these things need to work exceptionally well. Uh, and all of them can be simulated. Uh, and, and in fact, in, in our case, we actually do simulate most of these things on some level. Uh, and so if you can go to the next slide, Gail. Uh, this, is, this is a diagram uh, that shows all of the different sensors uh, that a vehicle may have. Not every car has uh, all of these sensors. 
you know, so for example, uh, our vehicle makes heavy use of LIDAR, um, less use of radar. Uh, but these are all things that need to be uh, dealt with in simulation uh, somehow or another uh, in order to guarantee that your system is working as expected. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about LIDAR uh, because we use it a lot and because I think it introduces some of the most interesting problems in the not too distant future. Uh, at the same time, I'll, I'll talk about what exactly a simulation is. So if you could go to the next slide, Gail. Uh, and, and so what this is, this is actually uh, a single frame from uh, one of our simulations. Uh, it's actually uh, some recorded data that we have um, from our vehicle. Um, and what you see is a computer rendering of our car. Uh, in overhead shot, uh, and then you see uh, the the famous Reno arch um, in LIDAR. Uh, you can also see, if you look very closely near the front of the vehicle, uh, you, you can actually see the paint on the roads. Uh, and so that LIDAR scanner that we use is building a detailed 3D model of uh, everything in the case of this LIDAR in front of the vehicle. Um, and because it sees an infrared, it can do things like read uh, signs on the road. So it can read a stop sign um, and it can see paint on the roads. In some cases, if we're close enough, it can even see uh, the, the numbers on a license plate, for example. Um, and so you know, cars are, are generating tremendous amounts of data, as we've said repeatedly. And to build a simulation, what we do is we take that data and store it and essentially replay the data. Uh, and so if I'm driving down the street and I'm recording all of that data, I can take the recording and play it back. Uh, and the thing that a simulation does uh, is it allows us to ask what if questions. So I can tweak some aspects of the, the, the historical record and say, well, what if that person who was standing at the side of the road had decided to, to cross the street? And using my digital copy of the, the environment that I'm driving in, I can play out these different scenarios and ask these kinds of questions. So, uh, you know, simulation really is absolutely essential to deal with, I think, as Gail called them, edge cases where, you know, it's really not, uh, you know, there, there are some things that don't happen often, uh, but when they do, it's very important that you get them right. So. You know, kids playing with a ball on the side of the road, throwing it out into the middle of the road when you're going 45 miles per hour, uh, and, and you need to know how the vehicle should behave or is going to behave. You know, you, you can't do that. You can't run that test in the real world. You do need a simulation. Uh, and so uh, we, can, we can use simulators to ensure that our system works correctly in those situations. Uh, we can also simulate uh, perception data. So if we need to simulate, uh, you know, how a LIDAR is going to see something that we've never seen before, uh, or how our camera is going to interpret an image, uh, we can use simulators for that. Uh, and they, they really, simulators run through a spectrum. So on the one side, you've got simulations that look like what we have on the, the, the current slide uh, that aim for more realism in terms of uh, what the vehicle is going to see. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, if you go to the next slide, you can see that uh, simulations don't have to be high fidelity and can actually look like uh, video games. Uh, and so, so this looks like a game, but it's actually an open source uh, driving simulator for autonomous vehicles. Uh, and uh, really all of these sorts of simulations have proved useful for ensuring that a vehicle works very well. Um, I don't have a slide showing it, but actually one of the most useful simulators we have for our vehicle uh, is a very, very low level uh, simulator for assessing how well our steering wheel control works. Uh, and that just shows uh, a box and a couple of lines. Uh, and so the, the graphical fidelity can be very, very low uh, it can be a little bit higher, like you see here, uh, or, uh, yeah. 
uh, or, or in some cases, it can even uh, it can even be more realistic than this. I know of at least one autonomous driving company that is has hired Academy Award winning uh, special effects artists to to build very very realistic, almost indistinguishable from the real world uh, computer models uh, that they then use to assess how their car is going to perform. Uh, so not everyone can do that, um, but regardless of, of the range of, of what people can do, uh, simulations are, are pretty essential for ensuring that every aspect of these complicated systems works correctly. So if I could ask you, Richard, so if you're sending yeah. your car, do, do you send your car then as you're trying to get this data, if you know that you want to simulate something specific or let's say four-way stop signs, Right. This is always mm -hmm. the challenge because people don't know how to deal with them. And so cars follow the rules that we tell them to follow. Right. So they're always yielding and you always have this people say in that simulate in that situation, the problem is nobody's going to move. Right. Because if everything is yeah. an autonomous vehicle, it's following <laughs> the rules of the road. It, it's waiting for the, the vehicle to the left to move. So do you send the vehicle out to a specific problem that you're trying to address to collect data that then you can simulate or can you just create that along the lines of the, the special effects way you described or is there a, a combination of that what's the ideal way or the way that you find most successful to do that yeah well so what we found is is useful uh is we'll take the car out uh, and uh, the thing about all of these autonomous vehicles right now, until we get to the point where we've got level five and they don't have steering wheels, uh, is that humans can still drive the car. Uh, and so when we're doing data collection, we are not typically also uh, testing our uh, autonomy capabilities. So if I need to get an example of a four-way stop, uh, I'll, I'll just drive the car there and I'll run all the sensors and record that data but I won't give control of the car uh, to the software. Uh, and so I'll collect that data. And then the, the question you're asking raises a really interesting problem. And I think this is actually the, the real downside to simulation. Uh, and that is that no matter how good your simulation of, of the, the physical world is, uh, simulating humans is extremely hard. Uh, and if you, if you think about the things that make uh, driving in you know, an urban setting challenging. It's, it's rarely features of the road or the, the built environment. It's almost always the, the other drivers around you. Uh, and so if you want a, uh, a good simulation of, say, a four-way stop uh, or, you know, pedestrians jaywalking with pets, uh, you need a good way to simulate that. And uh, there's kind of a chicken and egg problem there because if you have a simulator that is good enough to simulate uh, other drivers at a four-way stop, you have a computer program that can, can imitate a human perfectly at a four-way stop. Um, and so at that point, you've kind of solved the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and there are ways around that, trying to build incrementally better simulations of people. Uh, but it is an extremely hard problem. And I, I would argue that probably most groups working on autonomous driving don't have great solutions. Uh, to it. There are a couple of exceptions, but uh, I would say that's still a, a very challenging problem. Right, because you're trying to teach a, a computer system to react or to anticipate people acting irrationally. Yeah, yeah, or, or not even necessarily irrationally, but just in, in ways that uh, are hard to, to capture with statistics. Right, that's a kinder way to put it. And that, that kind of also just we'll throw this out there to people, it begs the question of how good do, do autonomous vehicles have to be? People have suggested that we're holding autonomous vehicle technology to a higher standard than people because we have plenty of data showing that people are not great drivers, but we're, we're you know, people have accidents all the time. But as you explained, you know, we're trying to make sure that these vehicles don't make mistakes, but we don't hold people to that standard. So uh, 
Richard, any thoughts on that? Where the challenges, like how do we fund the line? How do you how do you reach a comfort level that you've you've done enough simulations or it's good enough, it's as safe as it can be? Do we really need a li- eleven billion miles? Is that the magic number, or is there some other potentially helpful indicia? You know, I I don't know that eleven billion miles is a, a magic number, uh, and I think that in in a lot of cases you've got that that question of are you driving. Um, 11 billion miles, or are you driving one mile 11 billion times, you know, repeating your experience? Um, but, but I think that the, the thing that we still see with automated vehicles, and I, I still see it with my car occasionally, I don't think that there's anyone who has really uh, gotten past this point, uh, is that uh, occasionally when the vehicle makes a mistake, the mistake it makes is unlike anything a, a human would do wrong. Uh, and so it is true that humans drive uh you know, sometimes pretty badly. Um, though I actually think human driving is, is amazing. The amount of stuff we have to do to drive is, is remarkable just from a, uh, a perspective of, of the complexity of the task and how well people do it. Um, but, uh, you know, for example, a really common problem a couple of years ago that you still see with, with some groups that are just getting started uh, is their, their vehicle, when it approaches a, a, an intersection, will get the green light it'll start to inch forward and then something will happen and the car will stop in the middle of the intersection. Uh, it is very rare for humans, even new human drivers to, to make mistakes like that. Uh, but, but for these vehicles, it, it, it's actually extremely common. So the California DMV will um, re- requires manufacturers that are testing in California to submit incident reports every time their vehicles get in an accident. And uh, when you go back and look through the history of those, it is extremely common that these cars get rear-ended. Uh, and it's because they do something like that. They, they pull into an intersection when they have the green, uh, but they, they either uh, stop completely or they dramatically decrease their speed and then they get hit from behind. Um, and, and as long as those kinds of problems are still happening uh, and the cars can't really explain themselves, I, I think we need more testing and higher standards. Um, I, I think that another thing that we haven't really talked about yet is that with a human driver, even even a brand new, you know, just got their license, human driver uh, can explain themselves as they're going. And it is uh, still fairly uncommon for automated vehicles to be able to explain their actions as they are performing them. Uh, and, and so in the absence of some kind of explanatory power, um, I, I think that um, – that, that we need high standards and things like simulation to be able to ask these what if questions. And there are people working on, on um, you know, counterfactuals, counterfactual reasoning for, for artificial intelligence, uh, but that work hasn't really made its way into autonomous driving yet. And until it does, uh, these kinds of tools that we're building now uh, are gonna be uh, the bare minimum. Right, so can you give us a sense when your simulator works, how much data are we talking about? Are you using it and then disposing of it? Are you keeping kind of the intake data that you get when you drive the car around and then separately keeping records of what you run through the simulation and then kind of data showing what the result was and then how you tweaked it? it so theoretically, in, in some simulation system, how much data at which stage could we be talking about something that could be discoverable or something that could be used later either to show a regulator that your car is safe enough if we continue the self-certification system we have of vehicles now or for other uses? How much how much data are we talking about and what what could it be showing? Yeah, so so the raw data generated by the vehicles is a tremendous amount of data. It's really a prohibitive amount for, for almost everyone. Um on the order of many multiple terabytes per day uh, if you if you do a couple hours of driving. Um, the good news is that most of that data is not necessary uh, to uh, even to evaluate the performance of the vehicle. So, um, you know, LIDAR data, that point cloud that I showed in the previous slide, uh, as you might imagine, can can be very large in size because you're you're building an accurate 3D model essentially of an entire city. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, Google Maps on steroids, but, um, 
for something like a, a simulation to, to verify that your car behaves the right way at a, a four-way stop, uh, you, you really only need a, a handful of numbers. You need to know where your car is, where the other cars around you are, and how they're moving. Uh, and so the amount of data you absolutely need can be much, much smaller depending on the task you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so, so I think that one of the challenges in designing uh, you know, ways to verify your compliance with any future regulations is gonna be figuring out ways to do that uh, in a data efficient manner. Right, so it's essentially getting through a lot of the noise and finding the pieces of data within what you have that are actually helpful. Yeah, exactly. If you think about how you drive uh, when you're in a car, uh, if, if I were sitting in the passenger seat and I asked you to describe what you see, you'd probably say, well, there's a stop sign about five car lengths ahead, and so I'm slowing down. You, know, you would not describe the, you know, the, the waterfall in the front yard of the house that's on your right, even though you actually see it. Uh, and so, you know, we humans focus in on the things that are relevant to the task we're performing, and we're going to need to figure out how to do that in sort of a similar way as far as data management is concerned with autonomous vehicles, because they, they just record everything. Right. So how could we use this data from simulations, Richard, to demonstrate to a regulator or to the public, which we repeatedly see surveys showing that people, the very people who could be helped by this technology are wary of it older people, disabled people, how, how can this data be used to demonstrate to a regulator that the vehicle, the technology is safe or it should be approved that, so we could get closer to getting these vehicles on the road? You know, I, I, I think it's, it's challenging to use this data to, to convince people, but I do think it's gonna be necessary. Um, and so uh, I, I think what you would need, kind of going back to what you mentioned earlier about sort of a driving driver's license or a driver's test for, for autonomous cars, uh, it is ideally you'd have a, a collection of scenarios that a manufacturer could bring their system to and um, they would essentially take a driver's test. and. You know, in a perfect world, I would say that, that the vehicle should be able to explain itself as it's taking this test. You know, why does it do what it does? Um, and if it passes that test, uh, again, perfect world, um, you, would, you would then say this car is, is, is safe to drive, safe enough to drive. Um, you know, that, that is, you know, we're a ways from that. But I think that um, if something like that were available and if the results could be made publicly available, uh, I think that would go a long ways to convincing people that uh, that that the the system is safe. So, and I'll I'll throw this out to to everybody. So, right now we have self certification for vehicles. Manufacturers manufacturers self certify that they've met certain standards. There's talk about maintaining the same system for autonomous vehicles, but people have raised potential ethical issues with that and whether or not we're comfortable enough or we have enough of an understanding at a regulatory level to help to allow manufacturers to self-certify their AI systems that go into AVs. Do we need regulation around how the AI works? Justin, Ron, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, my first thought would be what's the response going to be when a company has self-certified and something goes wrong. So if that happens, my expectation would be there would be an outcry and a rush for regulation. And I wonder whether, Gail, if that's the possibility, it might be better just to regulate in the first instance and avoid the idea of self-certification. Right, but just, just to play devil's advocate, right now we have traditional cars on the road and things go wrong with them all the time too. And we have a self-certification system in this country. So what would be the, the basis for treating uh, automated vehicles differently? Because we're dealing with a technology that most people don't understand, that most people are probably, depending on age or whatever, uncomfortable with. And we want to have wide acceptance. And I don't know if we're at the point where we know how a fuel pump works, 
or we know where the brakes work properly or whatever with uh, automated driving, Gail. It's a question of comfort with Gail. technology. I don't know whether the, where, that we're there. Yes. Hey, Gail, it's Justin. I would come at it Please, from a different perspective and say, when you look at this type of technology and you have to think of it more broadly in the interconnectivity, meaning it's just not one autonomous vehicle, but think about all of them traveling along I-95, pick your congested corridor. And if you don't regulate the AI or the technology, the opportunity to have a far more reaching consequence that's bad, I think, is a lot higher. I don't want to scare the audience, but when you start talking about AI and autonomous vehicles, I mean, I'm learning how to fly a drone. You start to get into Terminator-like discussions. And, you know, I would also point out when we've had things in the past where for-profit corporations, if they're solely left to their own devices, are they going to say, well, you know, this was an acceptable level of risk. We can handle the lawsuits. It's this, as opposed to having regulations so that you know that the AI is acting in accordance with its programming. How, how else are you going to get at that if you're relying on a private corporation who their, you know, their reason for being is to make a profit, which may conflict with the fundamental safety issues that are created with an autonomous vehicle? Richard, I'll just, I'm going to play devil's advocate again, just for everyone now who is horrified. Um, w without a high degree <laughs> of, of regulation, uh, over in your neighborhood, your part of the, the United States, we've had platooning trucks, right? We've had 18-wheelers, as many as seven of them driving in sequence with being controlled by a driver in the front one. Right. So, and that that worked without yeah. incident. I think a lot of people are surprised to hear. And again, their trucks and, and passenger cars are different. But putting that aside as an example of that working, how does can you just give us some balance on that? Yeah, so so I think uh, my, my personal opinion is that we probably need something along the lines of what the FAA does with new aircraft as far as standards and certification are concerned. Um, and, uh, but, but right now, you know, at the very beginning of this, while there are a few vehicles on the road, uh, it actually, it, the, the self-certification process seems to be working reasonably well. Um, I, I think a lot of that though, is that even large companies are very afraid to be sued at the moment. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think there's a law, a very conservative attitude towards testing uh, with aut autonomous vehicles. And that's why a lot of the groups that are the most concerned about getting things right are doing so much in simulation and investing, you know, so many millions of dollars in building very good simulators uh, because they don't want to get to a situation where there's a catastrophic failure that results in loss of life for multiple, you know, lots of people. Um, and, and I think that that's how things are going to go for a while. Um, I don't think it's going to be like the beginning of aviation where the, the people who were flying back in the, you know, the teens, the 20s, and even the 30s uh, were, were the barnstormers who were doing it for entertainment. I, I think that there's a much more conservative attitude towards the engineering at this point um, that is, I think, going to help the case of people who want to say we don't, we don't want to regulate quite yet. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think even if you take it from the most cynical perspective, the, the industry understands that if there is a catastrophic accident, it's all done, right? If if there's something that really goes wrong, people are just never going to buy these or use them. So uh, I agree with you. I think the established manufacturers are being very careful because they want to make sure that, that that doesn't happen. Nobody wants to be associated with the first really bad accident. So I yeah, think you've done a great job. Go, go ahead, Richard. Oh, I was just going to say that the the one the one you know sort of uh, major accident that has happened in the United States in Arizona caused uh, Uber to basically shut down their program for I think uh, many months over a year, where they they essentially stopped driving. Um, and I, I think that that something larger than what happens there uh, w would be probably fatal to almost all of the companies that are developing this technology. 
And I think you can also say that if you put aside Uber and Tesla, there there are different approaches, uh, you know, of manufacturers yeah. about how to develop these vehicles and how to test them. But, and again, personal opinions, but putting that to the side. So now that we have a really good understanding of how this works, and thank you so much for that, Richard. Now we understand about the data, what we have. Let's talk about some of the ways that this data could be used as evidence because as we just talked about, there's there are tremendous potential for litigation here. And so different ways, you could see that if you were, and this is what we're gonna talk a little bit about all these different parts, but to demonstrate safety, we talked about a little to gain regulatory approval potentially and for self-certification. So now it's potential evidence. So this, these are kind of the, the categories of ways that this could be used to regulatory proceedings. Ron, how do you think that this kind of data could play in a regulatory proceeding? Oh, it's easy. You could have a proceeding, for example, where there is regulation that's been, in, that's been adopted for certain technologies, and the simulation data needs to be submitted to the agency, the NTSB, if there's an accident or some regulatory agency to decide something. So that I think is a pretty obvious use for regulatory proceedings. The question's going to be there, how adversarial are they going to be, the hearings, and what type of proofs is the agency going to be requiring? We're gonna assume they're not gonna be bound by evidence rules, but there's gonna to have to be some demonstration, I would think, of accuracy and on top of accuracy, just basically how the simulation was done, how it worked, how the information is kept, Gail. So I think you're going to see this data used often in regulatory proceedings as we go forward. So Richard, that's good news for you because you're going to be working as an expert witness for many years to come. <laughs> but just in, in, to be more serious, and, and Ron, you can speak to this too. You know, we always talk about now, just in the litigation we have in cases with AI or even much simpler technologies that we're constantly relying on experts because this is complicated. It, it, what would it look like in a regulatory proceeding, Richard, to explain to somebody how your simulation worked? And I'm sure you, there could be debates of, of, about between experts about what a simulation showed, if it was accurate, if it was if you could reasonably rely on safety based on its results. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, one or two. I, I think that um, most of these simulators have some kind of graphical display. And so the nice thing about them is that uh, you, you can actually watch almost like a video of what the car is doing. Um, and you can, uh, for a lot of them, ask these what if questions. And I think the challenge is gonna be communicating that the the configuration of the simulation, which is usually done in a very technical manner, uh, really corresponds to the what if questions that I think are going to be uh, most relevant to uh, litigation or or a regulatory proceeding. Um, and that's probably something that that has been thought about a little in the industry, but um, you know building human comprehensible simulation templates is something that we'll probably see a lot of as these systems go live uh, in the future. Okay, so now let's talk about this data as potential evidence and being discoverable in civil litigation. Ron, what do you think about that? You alluded a little bit that this could be used beyond regulatory proceedings, but also in civil litigation. How can you see that coming in? What would the issues be there? Oh, the, I think an easy thing, a scenario would be, let's assume you allow self-regulation or self-certification, as you mentioned before, Gail. And a vehicle goes on the road and there's an accident. And the vehicle goes left when it should go right, or the vehicle rear ends someone or whatever. If I am a plaintiff in that action and I'm going to be bringing a strict liability claim and a negligence claim against the manufacturer of the vehicle, the seller, or whatever, I'm probably going to want to see simulation data if for no other reason to be able to see whether or not 
when the vehicle was being developed and the simulations were being run, whatever happened in this accident is something that was foreseen or modeled, if you will, in the simulation. So it seems to me you're going to be looking a lot for that, considering we're not going to be having beyond simulations to get a lot of information about the vehicle's operation and the like. And then, of course, picking up something you said before, there are going to be experts who say one thing, and there are going to be experts who are going to look at the simulation data and say something else. So I easily see this type of information coming into litigation, civil litigation. Right. So that raises the complicated question of collection and retention, so preservation. So assuming right now that there may be state level um, obligations to preserve certain data. I know it, it usually applies to uh, electronic data recorders. I don't know about it applying to simulation data, but if if a company is running simulations or someone who intends to eventually sell a vehicle has is using simulations now, is there a duty to preserve? that now for the exact reason that you mentioned that you might have to demonstrate or use it as a defense later or in a regulatory proceeding. Usually we say there's no duty, the duty's not triggered till you can reasonably anticipate litigation, but how do you see that applying in this context? Well, I would expect that, again, if we're in the world of self-certification and the like, this is the type of data that any company is going to want to keep, and they're probably going to keep it under some records retention policy, which doesn't have the force of law. But if there is a duty to preserve and a policy wasn't followed, that can create problems with regard to spoliation of information. But you're right. There's no duty. There's no legal duty to preserve the simulation data for litigation purposes unless the duty to preserve attached. That only attached attaches if litigation is pending that you're aware of or if it's reasonably foreseeable you're going to be sued. But I would think, Gail, if companies want to rely on this data, especially if they want to self-certify, they're going to have to be keeping information for certain periods of time. And I don't see any of this data since it's simulation data as being affected by any of the privacy or cybersecurity laws we have these days, because number one, I don't even know if this data would fall within the definition of any law, such as the California Consumer Privacy Act or the like. So I think this is going to be an area where companies are going to make their own decisions about what they keep and don't want to keep until they get the letter saying, we're going to sue you or there's an accident such as the one in Arizona that made the headlines when it happened that probably triggered a duty to preserve at that point. I, absent regulation, Gail, I just don't see any legal obligation imposed on any company to maintain simulation data. That's good news for a lot of companies listening out there, although we're not giving legal advice. It's encouraging. So, Justin, let's talk about privacy, which Ron just brought up. Privacy is a huge issue, and Richard can probably help us with this, too. But as we discussed, the car is surrounded by sensors, and we've heard complaints about these sensors driving around and recording people walking on the street who may think that they have a reasonable expectation of privacy, may not anticipate this, or we have where the car sensors can see the license plate of the vehicle in front of it, and it raises concerns about surveillance. What are your thoughts about the privacy implications of this technology, just these, what we've talked about a little bit for simulations? So... When I think about autonomous vehicles and all the sensors that you just described, to me, it's the number one issue. So when I'm working on a smart city project, one of the biggest concerns that I'm working through is the data that we're collecting, how could this be used you know, as surveillance? And then from a smart city perspective, you get into Open Records Act. If you have sensors and you see a license plate in front of you, 
That license plate can be attributed to a vehicle, which if you couple it with other information, allows you to be a, build a profile about an individual person. And so, you know, what I think would be a good discussion amongst the panelists is my experience by and large with technology is it comes out and people love the breathtaking efficiency of technology, but don't really think about the implications. And I use social media as now my favorite example of people not appreciating how the algorithms are really uh, tailored to all the data that these companies have created about you. So now put all of those sensors on a car or an autonomous vehicle and you start to want to get your head around that and say, okay, how do we balance and think about it from the beginning the benefit of this technology and all the efficiencies and whatnot and manage the privacy and the cyber risk because I think in the autonomous vehicle space with the safety issues being paramount, um, you know, I think it'd be helpful to have a discussion at least amongst the panelists as to, you know, what are the considerations? What might we think about? From my perspective, the initial thought has to be, what kind of data am I collecting? How could this data be used in ways that I don't anticipate so that we start to think about those on the front end? So Richard, taking this back to you, putting aside, I think Justin's concerns are very well-founded, especially in the, and we, we have those concerns mostly when that data is being collected by a manufacturer who's going to use it for marketing or things other than the operation of a vehicle. And those are things that we struggle with because they're very legitimate concerns and concerns about surveillance, data sharing to build the kind of invasive profiles he was describing. And that, you know, we always hear that that's why a lot of car companies want to get into this space or other companies want to get into this space like Apple or Amazon putting Alexa in cars to get more information about you. But putting that aside in simulation, is this kind of information, so the face of a person walking on the street, a license plate number of a car, is that the example of what you were talking about, how you get so much data, you're inundated with it at the intake, but that's the stuff you want to filter out because essentially it's junk for purposes of the simulation? Yeah, exactly. So for our experience in, in Nevada has been that uh, when we are, are looking at, say, installing a LIDAR at an intersection for a smart city application, we use the lowest resolution we can that will still uh, allow us to uh, detect a car, for example, so that we avoid some of these privacy problems. Uh, when we were first building a lot of these systems, I actually talked to some some folks in the EU about the GDPR and asked them their thoughts. Uh, this was before California's privacy law. Uh, and so it is possible from a, a manufacturer's perspective to take privacy into consideration and to, to build solutions that are minimally invasive. And then from, from our perspective, even with high resolution sensors, the, the kinds of things that really touch on privacy concerns are exactly the things we don't want. Um, and so if we can avoid, uh, you know, keeping data, you know, people's faces, for example, um, we, we will absolutely do so. Um, we've had some preliminary conversations of even uh, detecting people and then blurring them out or just removing the, the, um, the, the, the silhouette of the person completely. We haven't done that yet, um, but, but it is definitely possible. And I think that people are starting to be more aware of these kinds of issues um, as privacy becomes a bigger issue here in the States. Ron, can you tell us a little bit about the, the Supreme Court decision in Carpenter and how that may play in here? Well, I'm not sure it does, but Carpenter came out two years ago. Basically, it says that if law enforcement wants information, GPS tracking, if you will, easiest way to describe it, uh, right, historical cell tower information. Right. So GPS, okay. Yeah, historical cell site location information to track a person. Track a person for seven days or more, you need a search warrant to get it as opposed to an order. Now, I don't know how that would affect our manufacturer with simulated, with simulated data. My answer, or my thought probably would be, wouldn't affect it at all because number one, if the company itself is collecting the data and use it, that's private action. That's not state action. So the constitution doesn't 
affect that. The question is going to be if uh, the Nevada State Police calls up someone and says, hey, I need your simulation data for X, is that going to fall within the scope of a warrant requirement? And that raises a number of questions, Gail. I suppose it's possible. But the other thing I would raise with this, you know, Carpenter was based on this idea of something called the mosaic theory, which says that if you track a person long enough, you get private details of his or her life. And I'm not sure if you're driving down the road or you have a simulation of someone driving down the road for 15 or 20 minutes, that's going to trigger any kind of constitutional restraint. In Massachusetts, it's my, it might, because Massachusetts requires a warrant to capture real-time location as opposed to historical location. So I think you need to think about who's asking for it, what it's being used for, and what jurisdictions the laws are going to govern to collect the information. I don't know that any. I don't know that a simulation for 120 days or whatever is going to do anything. Right. Let's talk about admissibility a little bit, Ron. Also, what, what kind of questions are we going to be dealing with if we're in civil litigation and somebody's going to, trying to admit this data? Well, let's assume we do want to put it in for some matter. Uh, pretty simple. We need to number one. We need to decide it's relevant. So is simulation data going to be relevant to the accident that happens tomorrow? If it is, the big test, I think, is going to be authentication. So how do I go about showing a judge that this more or less proves or disproves some fact? And that sounds pretty simple, Gail. If the information is relevant, I think the argument is going to be, well, judge, we need it for X, Y, and Z. And we can authenticate it. We can authenticate it because it's printed out of a computer, and we have a federal evidence rule for that, or there's a hashtag or a hash value involved, self-authentication rule for that. And all that means is you don't need a person to come in and testify. You have a certification from someone. But the other question, interestingly for me, Gail, is when you get this stuff into evidence, who's going to be able to talk about it? And I think it's going to bring us back to the conversation you had before about experts. So we're going to see expert testimony coming in. They're going to have to satisfy Albert or Fry, get this stuff admitted. They're going to have to get it authenticated. We'll leave the hearsay aside. I don't think we have to worry about that. The original, I don't think we have to worry about. And the last question is going to be undue prejudice. And I have a hard time thinking computer simulation data is going to unduly prejudice anyone. But that's not to say an argument won't be made and it won't be made successfully someday. That in a nutshell, right. Gail, is I think what you need to do to get this stuff in. I think the big Perfect. issue is Thank going you. to be I think the big issue is going to be who's going to testify about it, frankly. Right. Okay, so Justin, we're getting near the end of our time, unfortunately, because we could talk about this for hours. But let's talk about the nature of this data, and you may deal with this in the projects that you work on. So a lot mm -hmm. of companies, just in general, when it comes to any kind of data, not just simulation data, consider what they do to be, the data to be proprietary, right? Different simulators work differently. You're looking for diff using information differently. Everyone's trying to create the best, the most efficient, the most accurate. So we hear, uh, again, it's proprietary, we're not going to share. But we also, uh, Richard discussed the uh, an open source simulator, Carla, I believe it was called. So we have open source. Can you talk a little bit about that tension? You know, is it proprietary? Are those the the, uh, the arguments we're going to hear? Is it a trade secret? Or should we be moving towards open source? What do you think about that? Justin, um, sorry. So Gail, is that, so, so to me first? Yes. So yes. Um, I think when we're talking about stimulation data, and so if you're using a lab, I think if you have, you know, individual manufacturers who may be trying to test something specifically, I think you're going to have a tension where 
you know, the marketplace so that you can compete in your marketplace. You may have a new feature or a technology you want to put on an autonomous vehicle. I mean, Tesla is a great example of how they've disrupted the entire industry. Um, and they might want to do that for competitive advantage. The way we handle it out on the project I'm working at is, you know, we try to respect that because obviously if you don't, it's going to be hard for people to want to come use your testing facility. But we've also put some parameters around, you know, the infrastructure that if you're going to use some parts of our infrastructure, depending on what the project is, you know, that data, you know, you share it with uh, the city. But I think where I come down on a lot of this data, uh, Yale, is for commercial purposes, a lot of these companies are going to want to have that data. Um, you know, for whatever competitive advantage they're trying to get in the, you know, car market, which is very competitive. That's why I think a lot of these projects that go out in Reno where they're building their own autonomous car and they can share that data or other projects where it's being done by groups that want to share the data so we get an accurate picture. I think the data may depend on, you know, who's creating it and for what purpose is it being created for. Richard, what are the challenges presented by the lack of interoperability? So if part of the goal of using simulators or that we'll get to this 11 billion miles faster or whatever the goal is, that we'll be able to demonstrate safety quicker and be able to get these vehicles on the road sooner. Are we? Is it self-defeating if we this data can't be shared and we can't aggregate it to to, to demonstrate the safety case or to demonstrate something to regulators? What do you think about that? Yeah, I, working at a university, I, I would say that everything should be open source. Uh, but because these simulators are so valuable, uh, I don't think that's realistic. Uh, what I do think is probably doable and what I would expect to see soon uh, is uh, standards around the inputs and outputs of the simulator. Uh, so maybe to convince a regulator, you don't need them to know how your simulator works. Um, but you do need to convince them that given a standard input, like a description of a four-way stop, um, it's going to do, your car is going to do the right thing in simulation. Uh, and so I would expect that, that we'll see standards around that, and that is going to be valuable, even if we don't get to see the internal workings of, you know, the different simulators used at these, these companies, which are, are radically different and probably uh, forever incompatible because they're so complex and they were never designed to work together. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. So unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left, but I'm going to let everybody share a final thought or prediction or uh, just something for folks to take away. Justin, let's start with you. Uh, let's start with Justin. Um, I think my final insight is Autonomous vehicles are going to be upon us sooner than we realize, and it will render moot a lot of these discussions about driver sharing, which has obviously been interrupted by the pandemic. And I think it's really important for our uh, listening audience, not only as potentially counsel to companies, but also as consumers, of what type of public debate do we want to have about the efficiency of these technologies versus the type of cybersecurity and privacy issues that we should not only expect, but maybe demand be built into these uh, technology systems so that we strike the right balance as opposed to some of the other things we've seen with social media where we're just beginning to truly understand things and, and results of technology that we truly didn't understand. And to me, we should learn that lesson and be able to apply it in this context and really think about the privacy and security issues as it relates to autonomous vehicles on the front end. Thank you. Thank you. Ron, how about you? My only comment on all this, Gail, would be through the prism of litigation, that at some point there's going to be a request to see this data, and it's going to raise questions about whether it's proprietary or not, something you, you posed before. And courts are going to be dealing with this as lawyers will by what we do with it and how it's used in some type of a proceeding. It's just something that's going to happen like it does with everything else we create. 
So thank you for having me today. Thank you. Richard? Yeah, I, I would just say that the automotive industry uh, and really everyone working on uh, not just self-driving cars, but robots, so, you know, drones and, and even delivery robots really have, have for a long time did not uh, really appreciate the significance of simulation, uh, but, but that's changing. And in the future, you're going to see simulation playing an essential role in verification and validation, not just of cars, but of drones and of really every type of robot that, that we're gonna see deployed over the next couple of decades. Uh, so it's definitely a subject to pay attention to and get a grip on now because it's only going to get more complicated as we see more robots in the world. Great, so Richard, that's a fascinating point. So are we, is there gonna be, do you envision a standard? Like, is there gonna be a standard for the AI systems or are we gonna have different standards for each technology? So a drone's gonna have one standard and cars are gonna have another. And because to Justin's point before about the IoT, that we're looking more and more to connect everything. So that just makes it even more complicated to try to get everyone on the same page for lack of a better phrase. Is there is it gonna be the same standard for all robots or as that, you know, using that term loosely, everything that's part of the IoT or everything that uses an advanced form of AI or are they gonna be different for each one? So my prediction would be patchwork of standards forever, uh, but there'll be a lot of overlap <laughs> in terms of what functionality is described for the different types of robots. Wow, so patchwork of standards forever. That's ominous, or I guess good for some people too. Um, definitely interesting. So, Ron, what do you think about that? So, we're thinking about all this data then in an IoT setting, in a smart city setting. You're going to have different standards for each of that. How's the court going to handle that? Well, to begin with, unless you have some federal regulation, it's going to preempt what states are doing, Gail. You're gonna, you are gonna have a patchwork, just like we have a patchwork in a lot of things now. You're gonna need the political will to have those national standards created. But if you don't, we will go through what we do now. We will come up with different standards that will apply in a court. And I expect you're gonna have experts again who are gonna be talking about what the standard is that's governing and once the court's made some threshold rulings, and you're going to have another expert who's going to, in an adversary system, should come back and talk about some other aspect of the reg or the inapplicability of the reg. So, yeah, I see a patchwork, Justin, too. <laughs> Justin, this kind of brings us back to where you started, the, the concept of privacy by design and cybersecurity by design. So it's yep. only going to make it more important that we think about privacy and cybersecurity at the front end because I think it's safe to say just from what we've discussed, we our, our clients have to anticipate that there are going to be challenges to these technologies and the simulation data that we use to help bring them to market or to make the argument that they're safe, they're functional, is going to be challenged. So is that does that only strengthen the case for the cybersecurity and privacy by design? Um, I think, you know, to the other panelists' point, if we keep having a hodgepodge system, we're going to have privacy laws in like 48 states. We already have breach notification laws in all the states in Puerto Rico and Guam. So think about the cost of all of that compliance and whatnot. So. I think you're going to see an increased requirement for this because now just to do business with Fortune 500 companies, they're going to say, well, show me your cyber plans. Show me how you handle privacy because of CCPA and GDPR. We may get at it that way, but think of how it will stifle innovation when you have all of these different standards among autonomous vehicles or drones or, or privacy or breach notification laws. And think of the complicated nature of the regulation if we continue on this path. I think it only becomes more difficult and will ultimately stifle the very innovation we're trying to uh, support. Right. Richard, back to you, that's a great point. We hear that a lot, that that's the concern. Some people see it as legislators just 
avoiding the issue or kicking the can that, you know, that if, if we, if we go into too much detail, right, to NHTSA issues guidance that really has no specifics and the, the rationale for that, which people disagree over is because we don't want to stifle innovation by being too specific. As someone who's actually building this, is regulation helpful to you? Is it really going to stifle innovation or does the lack of it make your job more complicated? What are your thoughts on that? You know, I, I think that the, the regulations we have in Nevada have been extremely helpful for us. Uh, and I do think there is a risk to uh, making regulations that are too specific right now, because you know, contrary to a lot of the advertising by uh, AB manufacturers, I think there are still some open scientific questions about how to make an artificial intelligence that can drive a car. Um, and if we start regulating uh, questions where uh, the science is not really even remotely settled, I, I think we'll put ourselves into a place where we have to undo a lot of that uh, it, once those questions start to be better understood. Uh, and so I think there is some, some definite advantage to sort of minimum standards for safety. Um, but I think the more specific the regulations become, uh, the trickier it is to, to make sure that they're not preventing the necessary science from being done to, to get the, the answers right. Yeah, that sounds right. So I think one thing we can all agree on is that this is fascinating technology and just from a, a big picture point of view, it, it has the potential, even if we don't get to level five, even if we're just at level four to create mobility for disabled people to help our aging senior citizen population. There's just a, a ton of benefits just from the technology that are kind of the component parts towards getting to a fully or even partially autonomous vehicle are incredibly beneficial and are in cars today, things that we've developed that help with safety. So it's a, it's a worthwhile goal. And I think thank you to everybody for discussing why simulation can play a significant role and what we have to think about to make that as efficient and as effective as possible, keeping in mind cybersecurity, privacy, litigation, how the data may be used and how we need to protect it. And so I'd like to thank all the panelists for a terrific discussion. And uh, unfortunately, our time has flown by. So thank you to everyone for joining us. And I'm going to hand this back to the ABA. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the American Bar Association and the ABA Tort Trial and Insurance Practice Section, Section sponsors, Thomas Reuters, MDD, and Atlas Legal Research, thank you for participating in this program. To learn more about the sponsors, visit the ABA website at AmericanBar.org. Thank you, and please click on the evaluation link. We value your feedback.